Well, Helen, thank you very much for reading for us. And may I add my uh, warm welcome. I know there are lots of people visiting us and one or two here for the very first time. And if that's you, I hope it will be the first of many, many visits here on a Sunday morning. Our subject over these five weeks uh, before the summer series starts in July is the end of the world. And my aim is that knowing the ultimate destination, uh, you and I plot a profitable course through this life. It's a series which, a a couple of chapters in Matthew 24 and 25 that we've looked at at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock, 18 months ago at the services here, and they are so important, I think so widely um, uh, misunderstood that it was useful to spend a few weeks looking at them here on a Sunday morning as well. Now, the idea of knowing the ultimate destination and plotting a profitable course is not an idea with which we are unfamiliar. People like to suggest that the English don't like talking about money very much. I've noticed since the 2008 crash that anybody who managed to take action in advance of the 2008 crash likes talking about money very much. Oh, I put it all in gold and hid it under my bed, they'll say, as they boast about their wise action. Oh, I invested in government bonds or I bought property or whatever it happens to be. And so we're all used to the idea of knowing where something's going and therefore taking wise action. Now, the student who knows that exams start on Tuesday is a fool if he hasn't taken wise action in advance. I'm sorry to bring that up for some of us. <laughs> and therefore, my, the aim of this series is not so much that we look at the origins, where we've all come from, that's really important, but the aim of this series is that we look at destinations. And our study material is uh, this teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in a private seminar with his disciples, which begins at chapter 24, verses 1 to 3. And in chapters 19 to 23, the narrative part of this section of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has been dealing with judgment on Jerusalem and the hierarchy of Israel. And it concludes in chapter 23 with these serious woes against his opponents. And then in chapter 24, Jesus leaves the temple and is going away, and his disciples come and point out to him the buildings, and he says, not one stone will be left upon another that is not thrown down. In other words, Jerusalem's temple is going to be utterly destroyed. And that then produces in verse 3, three questions from his disciples. When will these things be? It's hard to imagine the shock it would have been to the disciples that the temple in Jerusalem, this vast edifice, was going to be completely overthrown. When's this going to happen? And then the second question, what will be the sign of your coming? And the third question, and what will be the sign of the close of the age? So Jesus insists in these two chapters that there will be a cataclysmic end, and he encourages us to be ready, and he tells us that the wise man or the wise woman is the one who is faithful And he encourages us to invest sensibly today in the light of God's certain tomorrow. Well, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at how to invest wisely in the light of the end. And then finally, on the last week, we will come to the end. And we will look at the end itself. But uh, this week and last week, in these early verses, Jesus begins by spelling out what life will be like before the end. And we're dealing here more with preventative medicine, really, as Jesus warns us in verse 4, see to it that nobody leads you astray. And warns us in verse 24, false Christs and false prophets will arise performing great signs so as to lead astray. And warns us in verse 13, or encourages us in verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. And last week, we pictured in our mind's eye a timeline. And we noticed that following the fall in Genesis chapter 3, we have always lived in a period of global disruption. This world is under God's judgment. There have always been wars and rumors of war. There's always been famine and earthquake reported around the world. And Jesus tells us, following his death and resurrection, that this period of global disruption will continue right the way up to the end. 
And on the timeline, if we have here the death and resurrection of Jesus, here's the beginning, and here's the end, sometime out here, then all this period is going to be marked by wars, rumors of war, global disruption, famine, earthquake. That prevents us, doesn't it, from being naive, like perhaps some uh, liberal humanists who think we're going to kind of create a world in which all disease and all world, world disorder is eradicated. No, it's never going to happen, says Jesus. This world is a world under judgment. Don't be a naive optimist. At the same time, don't be an alarmist. Every time you hear of a war, don't go and build a bunker at the bottom of your garden and think the end of the world is coming. No, that's going to be the mark of this age. And then he warned us in this second part that we dealt with last week in verses 9 through to 14 of the context of Christian living. It will be a period of global disruption, but also there will always be what I called internal distress in the Christian community as we face persecution, verse 9, disloyalty, apostasy, verse 10, false teaching, verse 11, and then backsliding, verse 12. No surprise then to find on Midweek. I don't normally take the, uh, the Telegraph. I find it slightly too strong stuff for me at my age. I think you have to grow into the Telegraph, don't you, when you become more right-wing, perhaps. But uh, I did take it this week because there wasn't another newspaper in the, in, in the news agents, and I discovered this letter from a Church of England bishop arguing for same-sex marriage. Christian morality comes from the mix of Bible, Christian tradition, and our reasoned experience. Sometimes Christians have to rethink the priorities of the gospel in the light of experience. No, God has told us how we are to live. He's shown us what marriage is, and our experience actually has little to do with it. We need to see what the gospel says on the matter and submit to its authority. But Jesus warns us there will be false teachers. Don't be thrown out by it. This is going to happen. Don't throw your hands up in horror. It's going to happen all the way through. And interestingly, on the same day, my mother uh, handed me, she'd been clearing out a drawer, a copy of a letter. In fact, a, a letter from, I guess it was the Times in 1966, from a bishop of Southwark, Dr. Stockwood. Billy Graham's approach is very different from my own. I think our times want a different sort of evangelism an evangelism which gives more space to the social content of Christianity and to intellectual difficulties. Well, Stockwood tried that sort of evangelism in the Diocese of Southwark, and it emptied the churches because it wasn't truly Christian. We shouldn't be surprised in 1966, in 2013, to find false teachers. Jesus warned us that that's what we would, would find. And there is a danger that we forget Jesus' teaching and we throw our hands up in the air in absolute horror well, it's right to be horrified, but wrong to be surprised. We must realize that the context of Christian living will be persecution, apostasy, false teaching, and backsliding right the way through to the end, and the one who endures to the end will be saved. Well, this week, just two more features of this final era in which we find ourselves in the timeline between the death and resurrection of Jesus and his return. And the first is a specific period of total destruction, which is mentioned in verse 15 to 22. The subject in verses 15 to 22 of Matthew 24 is Jerusalem. And you will remember it was Jesus' pronouncement at the start of the chapter which gave rise to this private seminar. So here Jesus is addressing specifically when will these things be? When will the destruction come? And this private seminar has as one of its major themes the future of the temple and the future of Jerusalem. And these verses, 15 to 22, answer that. And Jesus' point in these verses is that the future of this earthly Jerusalem as a significant feature of God's global plans is over. I say that again. Jesus' point in verses 15 to 22 is that the future of Earthly Jerusalem, the city, as a significant feature of God's global plans for his kingdom, is over. You can see in verse 15 that he mentions the abomination of desolation. 
This refers to a prophecy in the book of Daniel, as you can see he says. That's why he says, let the reader understand. And back in the book of Daniel, God promised that a desolator would enter the city of Jerusalem, the desolator would set up an abomination in the temple, and that this desperate day of desolation would be marked by utter destruction. And here Jesus announces that this day is imminent. And all the language of verses 15 to 22 is of a specific period of catastrophic destruction. Just look down at it as I read it. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas for the women who are, women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight name may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now, at this point, I want to mention uh, a couple of views on these verses. And one that has become particular popul particularly popular recently as a result of a highly respected New Testament scholar, a guy called Dr. Peter G Bolt. He argues from the Gospel of Mark that the parallel verses in Mark's Gospel really refer to the cross. And his point is this, that because the book of Daniel is the language of flowery, apocalyptic, symbolic language, so the verses here are speaking symbolically about the cross of Jesus and they don't refer in the first instance to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, as I say, Peter Bolt is a highly respected scholar, works at Moore College in Australia. Here he is. His crucifixion will be a destructive act of sacrilege. Israel's leadership will welcome their long-awaited Messiah by handing him over to the Gentiles. If that were not sacrilegious enough, Pilate will receive the Messiah from Israel and condemn him to death by crucifixion. So Bolt's argument is that these verses refer specifically to the cross of Jesus and not to the, cr the crucifixion, uh, sorry, and not to um, the destruction of Jerusalem. May I say I find it unconvincing, as do a number of others, not least because of the parallel passage in Luke's Gospel. And I'd like you to turn there now. And you'll find the parallel passage in Luke 21 on page 1061. And I want us to look at verse 20 and verse 24, where Jesus says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And verse 24, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So do you see he speaks specifically there about the armies descending on Jerusalem, about Jerusalem being desolate and destroyed, about Jerusalem being overrun. And what I think Bolt has done has taken a very important idea, the centrality and the significance of the cross and resurrection of Jesus to mark the beginning of these last days in which we live, but loaded everything in Matthew 24 into that important idea in a way that it's very hard to substantiate from an initial reading of the text. If you want to ask me about that more afterwards, please do. So Jesus' point here is that Jerusalem will be absolutely obliterated, that his disciples should not linger at Jerusalem or cling to Jerusalem like Lot leaving Sodom. They should flee urgently from Jerusalem that God in, uh, God's people in first century Israel had rejected their Messiah, that God's city, Jerusalem, had crucified God's king, that Jesus had come to Jerusalem and pleaded with them, I would have gathered you as a chicken gathers her chicks under her wings, but they had refused to be gathered, and therefore that Jerusalem, as a foretaste of final judgment, as a result of rejecting her Messiah, 
was to be destroyed and overrun, and that the end of Jerusalem as a center of any religious significance was upon them. And so now that the place of Christ's royal throne room has shifted, the center of operations, if you like, is no longer earthly Jerusalem. The gospel of his heavenly royal kingdom is now to be proclaimed not simply to Jerusalem, but to the whole world. Christ is enthroned in heaven, and his kingdom is in heaven, and we are to proclaim his coming kingdom, but his kingdom is not to be built at latitude 31.8 north and longitude 35.2 south, earthly Jerusalem today. And that is precisely what happened in AD 70, the absolute annihilation of a city and its people. I want to pause now and address the other idea that we come across quite often, that God still has a purpose in mind for this earthly Jerusalem. And there will be many real Christians who hold this view, and it comes out of the stable of genuine Christian brothers and sisters who have a serious concern for God's people and God's word. And it may well be that there are some people here on Sunday morning, they usually are, who've come from a background that has placed very great emphasis on this earthly Jerusalem and its future. As far as I can work out, this idea that God has a significant future for the earthly Jerusalem gained most leverage as a result of a study Bible that was produced by a gentleman named Cyrus Schofield at a time when the authority and reliability of Scripture was under massive attack at the start of the 20th century. He popularized the idea of a brethren gentleman named J.N. Darby, evangelist and scholar. And may I say that every single one of us, if we traced back, owe a lot to the brethren and the people who sat under the teaching of the Schofield Bible and in this country where they defended the faith in the major assaults of the 20th century, many of us will owe our Christian roots to the work done by faithful men in those congregations. In their scheme, however, whenever they read the Old Testament prophecy concerning the city of Jerusalem and the end, they tended to read it in a linear, literal way, placing various dates along the time scale such that the prophecies of God establishing his royal rule at Jerusalem in the Old Testament referred without question to the physical place Israel. It didn't seem plausible that the prophetic language of the Old Testament concerning Jerusalem was speaking of the heavenly city, such that this earthly city, Jerusalem, was simply a shadow and a foretaste of a heavenly reality. And it's not at all hard to understand why they thought like that. And I think it's worth just pausing to ask us, well, why did they get into thinking that way? Well, because all around them were people who were denying the truth of Scripture. And the means by which people denied the truth of Scripture frequently was to say that such and such a Scripture was only meant as symbolic picture language. It didn't speak of any reality. And therefore it became something of a badge of orthodoxy in the middle of the last century in England and large parts of America to understand all Old Testament prophecy about Jerusalem as having a literal earthly fulfillment. If you didn't think it was literal and earthly, you must somehow have sided with all the liberal scholars who are saying the whole thing is symbolic and not literal. And particularly, you will find in the United States, particularly in parts of the south of the United States, this view is very much alive today that all Old Testament uh, prophecy concerning Jerusalem will have a physical fulfillment on earth at whatever latitude and longitude it was I mentioned just now, which I can't quite remember. And some would argue that this view, that establishing Jerusalem on earth, has unduly influenced American foreign policy in the Middle East to a very considerable extent. And certainly, when the state of the modern state of Israel was established in 1948, those who viewed everything as being sent around Israel went into a high frenzy because it looked like all these prophecies were being fulfilled. But I want to suggest that this teaching, that Jerusalem no longer has a place, ties in not only with these verses here where Jesus says, don't linger. 
Don't think about it. Flee. Leave it behind. Forget it. And that ties in with the teaching of all of the rest of the New Testament. So John 4, 21. Remember Jesus with the woman at Samaria? Believe me, the hour is coming and is now here when neither on Mount Gerizim nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. The time has come. We're actually worshipping the Father in Jerusalem as a specific holy center all over. Jesus, John 4, 21. Acts 7.55, Stephen looks up and where does he see Christ enthroned? In heaven. Acts 8, the disciples flee Jerusalem and start to proclaim the gospel all over the world. Hebrews 12, you've not come to what may be touched. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. That's where it's all centered now. So that all the promises of God concerning earthly Jerusalem in the Old Testament are now Can you say transmuted? Does that work as a word? To the heavenly city and his heavenly kingdom. And of course, in the passage Jeremy so helpfully used in the prayers, where does Jerusalem come from? It comes down out of heaven, the new Jerusalem, on the last day. It's not established in a physical reality in Israel today. So what will mark then the days in our timeline between now and the end? Global disruption. Don't be alarmed and don't be naive. Distress for Christians, persecution, apostasy, false teaching, backsliding. Don't give up. Keep going to the end. The one who endures to the end will be saved. And a specific period of total destruction, which happened in AD 70. Don't linger. Because the royal throne room of God is now with Christ, who is anointed and enthroned on high, the center of operations, if you like, Where is the center of operations? Where is the control room? It's now in the heavenly city with Christ enthroned, seated at the right hand of his father. And Jerusalem is no longer the center of operations. Now, let me say, I think this has substantial application for us today if we just pause and think about it. There is a strange kind of lingering Christian sentimentalism that at least gives the impression that we are going to establish an earthly kingdom here in Britain or in the United States of America or if China becomes the next global Christian empire, which it probably will, you can bet your bottom dollar that it will arise again in China in another 50 years' time, that somehow China are the sort of chosen race and we're going to establish earthly Jerusalem and a kingdom here in China. Some of my very distant relatives were British Israelites who, in the days of the empire, do you remember those days when the map was all pink? No, you don't. Probably most of you are far too young. It's now whatever color America is, and it'll be red for China in due course in no time. But when the the world was all pink in the good old days, uh, or or whatever, um, the, the, uh, the British Israelites thought that Britain, and particularly the royal family, were connected to the lost ten tribes of Israel. And that wherever Britain went, there you would have the kingdom being established in an earthly way and the advance of God's good and perfect rule. And, of course, they used to sing Jerusalem in those days. And I remember when I became a new Christian and I realized that actually God's concern was not for this earthly Jerusalem or to bring or to build heaven on earth the kingdom here today, but to bring his kingdom from heaven, his heavenly kingdom, at the end. When I became a Christian, I used to sit next to my mother. I may have mentioned this to you before, and you would sit next to your mother in a wedding, you know, a family wedding, and somebody will have chosen that hopeless hymn, Jerusalem. Sorry if you chose it at your wedding. And William Blake, who clearly had affinities with the Britain is the the great chosen race and all the rest of it, did those feet in ancient days, walk upon England's, and I used to write in large capital letters, as only a new convert can do, to my, on my, and show it to my mother, no. And then as we sang it, we would be singing away, and was his countenance, the countenance divine, and I would just quietly turn to my mother, oh, do be quiet, William, no, no, absolutely not, absolutely not. We're not to be obsessed with Jerusalem. We're not to think that Israel or Jerusalem or Palestine has any relevance whatsoever between now and the end of the universe. The new Jerusalem will come down from heaven. This earthly Jerusalem rejected 
its Christ and Messiah. And as a foretaste of the final judgment, God acted in judgment on Jerusalem. It was overthrown. And now the center of operations is in heaven, and we are to go about the work of our commander-in-chief, which is there in verse 14, to proclaim the gospel. And not to think that we're going to be able to some sort of sentimental Christian state in England where we can establish, you know, perfect Christian rule. And so, the center of action, as this work is carried out on earth, is not Jerusalem, it's the tiny church in a little hamlet in some far-flung village out in Essex where the gospel is being proclaimed. He died. He rose. He rules. He will come again. And the center of operations, yes, as the work of heaven is being carried out on earth, is not Jerusalem. It's your little office where you're holding a prayer group with two or three people and you're seeking to proclaim the Lord Jesus as king. He died, he rose, he rules, he will come again. And the center of excitement and activity is not earthly Jerusalem. It's Sunday morning as the gospel, Sunday evening as the gospel is being proclaimed. It's the proclamation of the gospel don't get obsessed with Jerusalem. And if you have bought tickets to go to the Holy Land this summer in order to have a spiritual experience because you think it's very special, why don't you sell them and give the proceeds to gospel advance and ministry um, somewhere across the world? No, do go and have a lovely time. But, uh, <laughs> but don't think there's anything special about it. All that we can create it in England, all that the royal family had anything to do with the lost ten tribes of Israel. Well, finally and briefly, this last day's deception is going to be the last mark. Don't be led astray. Verse 23 to 28. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, if I've told you beforehand, sorry, see, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, don't go out. If they say, look, he's in the interim, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So people, says Jesus, will emerge over the centuries claiming to be the Messiah, or suggesting they know when and where the Messiah will come. They will be remarkably persuasive, verse 24. They will seem to be able to perform great signs and wonders. They will appear to have evidence to back their claims. Verse 26, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness. And strikingly, many will be taken in, verse 24. Many will be led astray. But, says Jesus, when he comes again, it will be unmissable, unmistakable, and universally recognizable. There will be a cataclysmic end. He will return... The clock will strike, the curtain will fall, the play will end, and nobody will be able to miss it. And it will be no kind of mystical experience understood only by a few, verse 26. Look, he's in the inner room. You know, some people arise, oh, we know he's here, the Christ has returned. Some sort of mystical group somewhere in the inner room. And it'll be no kind of ascetic experience accessible only to a kind of ascetic elite, verse 26, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, oh, come on out here to the desert and we'll show you the Christ. And the point is made by verse 27 and 28 that his coming will be universally recognizable. And verse 27 must refer to the final coming of the Son of Man because all of these Son of Man sayings are connected and if you turn the page to verse 31, when the Son of Man, of chapter 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he shall sit on his throne. So here we are talking about the final coming of the Son of Man, and when he comes, nobody will be able to miss it. I remember the first time we went on holiday, um, uh, we had the most lovely time out in South Africa and we stayed on the beach in Durban and there was a balcony on the beach. You know when that, that I don't know what the climate is, is it tropical there? Whatever it is, it's hot. And uh, it gets very muggy all day and then you feel the storm brewing, the storm brewing, you all go to bed, nobody can sleep, fans are whirring, and then in the middle of the night it all hits. 
I remember going out onto the balcony, standing on the balcony. You couldn't miss it as the lightning covered one end of the sky to the other. Unmissable. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. If somebody comes and says, yeah, we found the Son of Man, don't believe him. It, well, you won't be able to miss it. And then some of you will have been on uh, an exotic holiday in the Serengeti Plain or something like that. You know the guy who got his binoculars out, where's the kill, where's the kill? There are the vultures. You can't miss it. He said, so this is an illustration, isn't it? Where a corpse is, there are the vultures. You know where the corpse is, you won't be able to miss it. Everybody will be able to see for miles around. It's like the day when they lit up the shard. You couldn't miss it. You could have been out in South End. You would have been able to see the lighting up of the shard. Everybody could see it. So it will be when he comes again. And, of course, all of us have uh, come across and heard of people who emerge. And have they just not read these verses? David Koresh and Waco in Texas. You remember that awful event? Somebody said, out in the wilderness, come, will, I am the Messiah. David Icke, former goalkeeper of Birmingham City. They needed a Messiah, but uh, he clearly wasn't it. Harold Camping, the end of the world is going to happen on the 21st of May, 2011. Whoops. On the 22nd, the end of the earth is going to happen on October the 21st, 2011. Whoops. October the 22nd, he retired. Or the Mayan calendar. The end of the world is going to happen on December the whatever it was, 2012. I remember seeing, watching the telly, and there was one marvelous program of... Um, about the, everybody expecting the end of the world and all the rest of it, followed by an advert from Foster's with somebody saying, typical Australian, oh, I think the end of the world's coming. He built a bunker and stashed it full of Foster's for the end of the world. But all of the Mayan calendar, the Harold Camping, the David Koresh, the David Icke, this is preventative medicine for us. And if the Lord Jesus has not returned in 20, 30 years' time and you find yourself in some far-flung village off in China or wherever it happens to be and somebody says to you, ah, oh, yes, we think we found the Messiah, you turn to Matthew 24 and blow a large raspberry at them if you can find raspberries in that part of China. Here then is Jesus' description. Isn't it interesting the way his word makes sense of the world? We always say that, don't we? We don't need the word of God in one hand and the newspaper in the other hand as sort of two sources. We need the word of God in both hands. And as you look at the word of God, it explains the world to us. And what is it that we find in the world? Precisely what Jesus says. A broken world. Don't be naive. Don't believe the naive, silly humanists who think they can make the world better and better and better. No, they can't, they won't. It's a broken world. It's under God's judgment. A broken world. And what do we find in terms of Christian experience? Real distress, persecution, disloyal apostasy. We find backsliding and false teaching. Oh, and what do we find? Oh, a specific period of total destruction. You can read about it in Josephus's um, Jewish antiquities. It makes for horrific reading. I, I wouldn't read it out again. I've read it out once from the pulpit here, and it was far too horrific to read. Uh, far worse than anything that happened at Stalingrad or Berlin. The overthrow of Jerusalem. Nothing like it. And then what will we find as we hold God's word in both our hands and look at the world? Oh yes, we'll find lunatics who come along and claim to be the Christ and try and lead us astray. Don't be led astray. The one who endures to the end will be saved. The center of operations is now his heavenly throne room, and we are to get on with the business, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, and then the end will come. And we'll come to that, so as to speak, next week. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that the unfolding of your word uh, enables us to understand your world. Help us to s ponder these words, to uh, consider them. Please write them deeply into our hearts. Help us to long for the return of Christ. Forgive us, Lord, when this has slipped off our agenda. Thank you that it's right at the forefront of yours. 
And we pray that you would enable each one of us in this building to live life today in the light of the certain return of Jesus. For your name's sake. Amen.